the issue of debt is not about incurring debt. It's about how you use that debt. Are you using that debt to expand your economy? Are you using that debt to expand your GDP? Are you using that debt to open up your country? Iwe Iwaro, lazima tujenge really. 1.5 billion US dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Kenyans, I want to assure you that the government will spend this money prudently. Kenya's economy is in serious trouble. The country's leadership has just pushed through Parliament a budget that is driven by the need to collect as much tax as possible. In fact, the government's target of 3.6 trillion shillings in the 2023-2024 budget, 1 trillion shillings more than the previous year's budget, speaks to the desperate situation that Kenya is in. But Kenya's debts don't come out of thin air. This story breaks it all down. It is a story of at least a decade of mismanagement of Kenya's loans, shocking corruption and debt dependency that has led the country to this point, told by auditors, analysts and insiders. August 27, 2010. Kenya promulgates its new constitution, a revolutionary document in many ways. Not only did it cement the political freedoms that hundreds had bled and died for, but it was supposed to usher in a new era of governance of the country's economy and strengthen governance over the hard-earned tax that Kenyans handed over to their government. I saw a Kenya where things were going to change, things were going to be controlled, things were going to be, you know, three arms of government, independent institutions, in other words, a Kenya which was open now to really moving forward in terms of uh, institutions and being in the league of what you'd call countries which are, you know, which are no longer quote unquote banana republics. So that was very inspiring and that's why I came to be the Auditor General. Join me, Guru Kenyatta, and my brother William Ruchi, and help us. Kenya, the next place. <laughs> Uhuru inherited an economy that was at six, almost seven percent growth rate. He found the coffers were full. The early days of Kenya's 2013-2023 regime, led by Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto, were full of promise and energy. The new administration elected Jubilee that was elected, uh, which I called Jubilee One, elected in 2013, uh, had plans of their own to, to expand the growth that had started under President Kibaki's reign, which everybody was very impressed with. Kenya had, in the years prior to 2013, seen what many had called an economic miracle. The economy grew from negative 1% in 2002 to 7% in 2007. Both pundits and government officials had predicted that last year's GDP growth rate would have been the highest since 1981. In spite of a calamitous election in 2007, the economy rebounded, avoiding the worst of the shocks of the global financial crisis. And by the time that the late former President Mwai Kibaki was leaving power, Kenya seemed well on its way to years of economic growth and the progress that came with it. There was an interest in one, um, finding new partners to lend, but at the same time globally, uh, China and some countries from the East uh, were prepared to, to lend under easier terms. But these countries also had their own interest globally. One of those was to express, to, I mean, to expand the BRI, which was China's signature. The early years of Kibaki mm. were a very interesting period. They were first and foremost one of the biggest breaks of a neo colonial era mm. that was holding a government. It was a time when 
there was the infusion of the Chinese into this economy. Mm. A break from our colonial masters, previous colonial masters, that were still very embedded here. Mm. What happened in 2002, mm -hmm. it was a dramatic shift. Kibaki supply side economics. Yeah. And Kibaki's avenue of opening up to new players mm. caused a very big stir. Mm. And many of us got caught into it. I have been inside. I've always been a man on mm. the road to Damascus. The root has always been the empowerment of Kenyans. Mm. Always. When we brought the Chinese yeah. to start doing roads, we cut prices mm -hmm. by two thirds. We quickened lead times. Yeah. So what would take three years, we're able to do in one and a half years. Mm. Okay? And we put concessionary money on the table. Jimmy Wanjigi was by his own public admission as well as public records and knowledge from the time, an insider in the Kibaki regime. So deep were his connections that when the most devastating corruption scandal of that era, the Anglo leasing scandal emerged, Wanjigi's name and business, Kwacha Holdings, was at the center of companies believed to have irregularly benefited from government contracts. Wanjigi is claimed to have threatened the whistleblower to this scandal, John Gidongo. Did you ever threaten John Gidongo, the whistleblower of Anglo leasing? No, not at all. I'm a law-abiding citizen, why would I threaten anybody? Never, I've never done that. Having played a key role in the construction of one of the country's largest infrastructure projects at the time, the Thika Superhighway, which cost Kenyans 32 billion shillings, Wanjigi was looking to extend his influence beyond the Kibaki regime into the Kenyatta regime, and had the ticket to do so, another large infrastructure project. That is a project I had begun in 2008, right? As a private project, yeah. a PPP with China Road and Bridge. Mm. We put in proposals. We wanted to replace RVR, which was failing. Mm. And our proposal after we did the technical, feasibility and technical studies, was that it was going to cost mm -hmm. from Mombasa to Malaba about 55 billion at the time, Yeah, right? And really, what we are doing is not doing the civil works you're seeing going up. Mm. It was going to be a track on the ground, mm. but SGR track. Okay? But the new regime had other plans, and they were in line with global trends at the time. So I was very much involved in the SGR project. I was the vice chair in my first time in parliament. I was the vice chair of the Public Investments Committee. And we looked into an inquiry on the SGR contract. And there were reservations that were there on how the contract was procured and the cost element of that contract and the impact it would have on our economy. And a lot of good things were said about what was envisaged to be achieved by the economy. We were then told all those niceties, and that's why I said everything that glitters is not gold, not everything you are told is what it seems. Have you actually laid dice on the SGR contract? Have you? Have you yourself? I'm not in the public investment committee. <laughs> uh, I remember one of your colleagues in the media uh, I can't remember who it was, did ask that question to the, our former president, Huru Kenyatta. And he said within two weeks, he would release that contract. And I have never laid eyes on it myself. Some of that money was invested uh, in, the, in the standard gauge railway, the train, uh, overhyped, it was very old technology. Did you have a chance to audit the usage of that loan? You know, that's where the system started wrong. And that system starts wrong by giving a system what you call government to government. Let me tell you, this government to government is, I think, sometimes abuse, okay? When in reality, what you are talking about is an institution owned by, partly owned by government and mostly private, is the one doing the business. So let me start. So when you come back to the SGR, 
This year, I, I believe, was a, a process, a, 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 an infrastructure which had been thought about or which was good. And when I look back, the figures they were talking about and the figures we ended up borrowing, I say, so really, what, what, what was the additional thing? Were we now doing two lines? <laughs> Rather just than one line. I mean, th that was a concern. Now, the second level of concern is this thing was really a one-sided thing. It was packaged, brought, and we accepted. Okay? Uh, ironically, I made a report once about uh, potential contingent liability on the assets of Kenya, Kenya Ports Authority. And, uh, you know, I was, I, was, uh, I was told, you know, I was really criticized. Just one year after Kenya took a $3.8 billion loan to finance a railway whose economics were shaky at best, Edward Owuko would face a difficult test with yet more debt. Kenya's first foray into the commercial bond market in June 2014. A $2 billion headache that was his to begin with but is every Kenyan's migraine today? Poor negotiation. Um, I think some of the terms that government of Kenya negotiated, both for the euro bond and especially for, let's go by a specific project, the SGR, were very, very poor. Uh, that level of borrowing shows the absence of care, uh, caution, and that people who negotiated on Kenya's behalf were not meticulous. I think some of the stuff they did would be very troublesome if an auditor was just to look at it and say whether they were actually acting in good faith and whether they actually understood that they were working in the interest of Kenyan public welfare. We have the Auditor General keep saying money was stolen from Eurobond, Eurobond. I did not appoint you. <laughs> All right? I cannot sack you. What is your problem? Sema, kama imeibiwa, sema iliibiwa na uhuru. We also reveal evidence showing that the government's initiative to construct two dams in Kenya's North Rift combined Kenya's new debt addiction with its old illness of corruption. 